<laughs> Thanks, Eva. Uh, good afternoon, comrades and friends. Um, especially good to see such a, a nice delegation from North Carolina this year. Um, so I'm going to talk today uh, and, uh, about the, the right-wing takeover of the North Carolina government, about the Moral Monday movement, and uh, share some thoughts on why this happened and, uh, and what's needed. And I think that there are some lessons uh, that we can draw from other, uh, for other states what, what may be coming. Um, we know that when poverty and competition for jobs is intensified during a capitalist economic crisis, one common result is the rise of an extreme right-wing faction in the ruling class. Uh, in addition to the rise of the neo-fascist Golden Dawn in Greece, ultra-right-wing ultra parties have gained popularity and influence in the imperialist countries of England with the UKIP and the National Front in France. And in the United States, this phenomenon is seen in the far-right Tea Party faction of the Republican Party. In, can you hear me? All right. I'm, you all know this stuff. The, uh, <laughs> so in collaboration with certain key corporations, this uh, ultra-right Tea Party faction has taken uh, complete control of the state apparatus in North Carolina now. Um, in 2011, the far right took control of the state legislature. It was actually the first Republican legislature in North Carolina since Reconstruction when the parties uh, were sort of aligned differently, the bourgeois parties. They attempted in 2011 to pass a number of reactionary measures, including stripping teachers of dues deductions, uh, repealing the Racial Justice Act, a racist voter ID bill, the worst in the country, and a bill that would allow uh, pretty much unlimited hydraulic fracking for natural gas. Popular pressure at that time was able to force the Democratic governor at that time to veto these measures, but they were only a temporary victory. In addition, the legislature redrew all the voting districts along racial lines uh, to mi minimize the voting power of African Americans and to secure right-wing control of the state government for the foreseeable future. In 2012, to make matters worse, uh, the far right was able to elect Governor Pat McCrory, who is a former executive with North Carolina-based Duke Energy, which is now the largest utility company in the United States, the largest power company in the United States. Uh, that same election saw the passage of Amendment 1, which made same-sex marriage unconstitutional in North Carolina. With McCrory in office, the right-wing takeover of the state government was complete. All of the bills that had been vetoed previously were quickly passed and signed, along with so many other right-wing attacks, I could only list a few before I would run out of time. Most notably, closing abortion clinics across the state, massive cuts to public education at every level, eliminating tenure for public teachers, cutting unemployment to 170,000 workers in North Carolina, rejecting federal funding, and this wasn't even state funding, rejecting federal funding that would have paid for Medicaid for 500,000 people, and changes to the income tax system that will benefit the rich on the backs of poor and working people. That's what's happened just this year. In the face of that, many in the movement in North Carolina were stunned uh, by, the, by the sweeping nature of these attacks, by the force of these attacks. Um, you know, I've lived there most of my life, and, and many liked to think of North Carolina as more progressive than the rest of the U.S. South. Um, and in some ways, North Carolina had a better public education system than many southern states for a time. Uh, it had some minimal social welfare programs, uh, some minimal environmental protections, uh, and many of these reforms had been won, hard won, through decades of struggle. So the question that many in the movement were asking themselves was, was how was all of this taken away so easily and so quickly in such a short period of time? And, uh, and that's, I think, why we, we um, the, our role in Workers' World Party and with the Durham branch has been uh, not just to fight back against these cuts, but also to try to explain to the rest of the movement uh, how this could happen and what is necessary to stop uh, uh, um, to wage defensive struggles in other states when this comes up. But before I answer that question, I want to turn to the dramatic and historic fight back this year, uh, mostly in the form of the Moral Monday movement, which was led by the state North Carolina NAACP. 
The first Moral Monday demonstration in April of this year led to 17 arrests at the General Assembly, with about 50 of us uh, protesting and supporting those who were arrested. Over the following months, this grew to almost 1,000 arrests at the General Assembly, with tens of thousands uh, demonstrating every Monday, week after week. And thousands more have, atten have attended Moral Monday demonstrations all across the state of North Carolina. Uh, in thinking about Moral Mondays, I was, uh, at the same time I was preparing for a class we do on the Russian Revolution, and I ran across a lecture that Lenin gave on uh, the 1905 revolution, where he was describing the Bloody Sunday demonstrations of January 1905. And uh, the demonstration there was, was led by a priest, and it had a fairly minimum program, uh, calling for amnesty, for civil liberties, for fair wages, uh, for the gradual transfer of land to the people, and for the convocation of a constituent assembly on the basis of universal and equal suffrage. These demands, and even the religious character of the leadership, I think closely match the Moral Monday demonstrations. Now, Lenin notes that these demands were similar in some ways to reformist demands of social pacifists or opportunists who are trying to divert people from the revolutionary struggle. But he said that's not what was going on here. He didn't criticize them in this context because he says that what that demonstration showed was that uneducated workers in pre-revolutionary Russia proved by their deeds that they were straightforward people awakened to political consciousness for the first time. Similarly, in North Carolina, despite some differences we had with the Moral Monday leadership and many challenges of working with them, the Durham branch and our allies have committed all of our energy to enthusiastic support of Moral Mondays because here again we have thousands of workers who are awakening to political consciousness for the first time through the Moral Monday movement. Many, many or most of those who attended these demonstrations were not the usual suspects. They were not members of unions for the most part or organized labor. They were newly radicalized workers and they demonstrated their consciousness and their revolutionary potential through their deeds through their willingness to face arrest, and crucially, uh, through their willingness to follow the black leadership of the NAACP, even though most of the demonstrators were white, uh, which is really remarkable in, in racist uh, North Carolina. So I'm not trying to suggest, don't mean to suggest at all, that we are in an analogous period to pre-revolutionary Russia. <laughs> because we're missing the most important piece Lenin, in describing what happened in 1905, goes on to talk about the large number and the importance of strikes among the newly developed working class. What we lack in North Carolina, what we most desperately need in North Carolina and around the country, is a strong independent labor movement led by the most oppressed workers. To return to my earlier question, this is why the right wing was able to sweep away decades of progressive reforms in North Carolina in a matter of only a couple of months. It's because we're still the least unionized state, the state with the worst labor laws, not just right to work, but also the Jim Crow era ban on collective bargaining for public workers. It's because we lack a strong labor movement. And the right wing knows that this is our weakness, which is why their worst attacks have fallen on teachers and on public workers when they begin to organize. In Russia, the newly awakened conscious grouping was directed into mass strikes. In North Carolina, it remains to be seen what we can do with this energy from the Moral Monday movement. Fortunately, the NAACP leadership has so far kept the energy from being diverted into the bourgeois Democratic Party, but much of that energy has yet been diverted into court challenges to these laws. Now, just an aside briefly, many of the attacks and the most uh, publicized nature of the attacks have come on voting rights for African Americans. And it is important, it is crucial that we defend these democratic rights as a racist attack on the democratic rights of African Americans in the South because of our understanding that this isn't just about uh, a, a civil rights lawsuit to participate in the democratic system or to be able to elect more Democrats. When viewed in, in, the, in the context of the history of North Carolina, this attack on voting rights has got to be um, it, it's not reformist in any way. The most revolutionary action we can take is to defend the voting rights uh, in North Carolina. So I want to applaud the, the North Carolina vote defenders who are here. For the students working on that. 
but not just by defending the voting rights, but most importantly, by building the labor movement in the South, by building the Southern Workers' Assembly, and through that, to deepen our solidarity with all of its members, with UE 150, my union, the North Carolina Public Service Workers Union, with FLOC, with the UFCW local at the Smithfield plant, with the teachers, and most especially, with the low-wage workers. If we don't, in North Carolina and around the country, the result is going to be the same. We're going to be losing, waging and losing defensive struggles for the gains that have been won through struggle for the last 50 years. So I'll stop here. Tomorrow at the assembly, Comrade Ben Carroll is going to talk more about how we're continuing to build the Southern Workers' Assembly, which is our most pressing task in this period. It's not enough just to organize around our particular issues or in particular communities. If we don't build people's power, if we don't build the, the, the organizations and the infrastructure, whether it's the, the, the newly organized fast food workers or the, or the Southern Workers' Assembly is the vehicle we're using, uh, then, then we're going to be um, faced continually with these defensive struggles and, uh, and maybe not facing them successfully. Um, but that's not going to happen. We're going to build the Southern Workers' Assembly, organize the South, build a workers' world.